Well, it seems a little bit odd to have a microphone, but we are taping this. That's why there's a microphone. Um, so I'm Karen Mundy, and thank you everyone for coming, and an especially big thank you for Lauren. Lauren is uh, in her second term at Boise, and uh, she has agreed to take the hot seat and be the first of our junior faculty or early career faculty to present in a faculty colloquium. And I think it sets a precedent at OISE. I don't think we've ever had an early career faculty pro uh, coll colloquium since I've been here. So Lauren, thank you. Uh, John Portelli is going to give some comments at the end of her talk, and I think it's going to be very engaging. But before she comes up, could I just encourage people to come a little bit to the front? Um, you know, th this is intended to be more of a colloquium and less of a formal talk, so I think it'll be... Uh, uh, yeah, I understand. Okay, good, Lauren. Thanks, Karen. I'll let everyone get settled. Is that okay? Okay. Well, first, I want to thank Karen very much for um, inviting slash encouraging me to to take this on. And I'm it, it's a great opportunity, especially as an early career faculty. So I'm just really excited that you could all come, and I'm excited to talking to you. I um, of course, want to make a few disclaimers and uh, contextual remarks before I actually begin talking. So a few words before I say what I'm going to say. Um, this talk is not exactly a research talk. And um, to that end, if that was the intention of the early career faculty colloquium, I, I regret if it's not exactly what the, uh, what, what the recipe was. Um, however, I do think this will be a great opportunity for me to talk to you about the field that I'm embarking on. And the way I conceived of this talk arose out of some conversations that I had with Karen and others uh, since I arrived at OISE about what ethics is and what different researchers in education uh, feel they can benefit from using the study of ethics. And one thing I found quite quickly was that there was an interesting array of views about what ethics is and how ethics intersects with education. and. Um, Part of this talk is me working through for myself, as well as hopefully for the rest of the community to some extent, uh, how ethics and education intersect and what I see the philosophical study of ethics, which is my training, contributing to our understanding of education and various questions within education. Um, so this is quite expository. It's very, very broad. I won't be giving any detailed arguments in this talk. I'll be rather trying to determine the contours of a very large field and make a few provisional conclusions about that field and what we can do within it. Um, I also think that this is a good opportunity to help define my future work and my role at OISE, given that I applied for this position called Ethics and Eth Ethical Inquiry, uh, which was OISE-wide. And it's and it's interesting in part because so many people at OISE are already doing work that I would certainly count as part of ethics, some of them sitting in this very room. Um, so what does it mean to have an ethicist in an education institution? I'm not going to provide a final answer to that question, but I hope that my remarks today shed some light on where I see the field of ethics operating in educational studies more broadly. Um, finally, as my, uh, my final prefatory comment, I'm teaching a course this semester uh, from which much of this material and thinking is drawn. It's a course called Education and as Ethics. It's a graduate course. Um, it's been really stimulating and rich for me, I hope for the students as well, and I'd like to nominally thank that group of students for uh, great conversations and pushing my thinking about this issue. So I'm going to be referring to a few examples throughout the talk, and I hope that if the relevance isn't immediately clear, at least that'll emerge throughout the talk. The first example I'm going to use is a very famous text called Emile by Jean-Jacques Rousseau, um, which is a long discourse on pedagogy and education in the form of a kind of hypothetical narrative where Jean-Jacques, is the name of the tutor, um, takes on a pupil, a meal, from the time that he's born and educates him up to adulthood. Um, much, much ink has been spilled on 
interpreting this text and, and putting it in the history of philosophy of education. Um, the reason I'm raising it is because I think that it's such an unusual comment on education and tends to provoke some very charged responses, often a lot of disagreement. And as such, I think it serves really well as a kind of caricature of education or a hyperbolized form of what might be going on in more familiar educational settings. And that will enable us to shed, shed some light, I think, on what is happening ethically in educational settings. So what you need to know about Emile, if you're not familiar with the text, is that Jean-Jacques, the tutor, who coincidentally has the same first name as Rousseau, takes this pupil from the time that he's born, away from his parents, educates him in seclusion, in nature, with no other teachers or parents or family members or anyone except the individuals they happen to meet in their life in the country. And this is not an accident, but this is actually critical to Rousseau's conception of the ideal education, at least as he lays it out here. There's controversy over whether he meant it literally or whether indeed the text may have been written as a palino to undermine its very point. But nonetheless, um, it enables us to see some of the elements of education where we are not secluded with a tutor in a remote setting, um, but we have multiple teachers in a normal school setting, for instance. Nonetheless, some of the same issues come to the fore. So this quotation gives us a sense of how important it is to Rousseau to have complete control over the student. Let me be given then a pupil who does not need other people or I shall refuse him. I do not want others to ruin my work. I want to raise him alone or not get involved. This would certainly be an example of one of the features of Emil that provokes negative reaction and criticism. And I'm going to suggest that many of the ethical implications of this setup, which are rightly criticized, um, nonetheless tell us something useful about all educational setups. We also have a lot of intuitions about ethics, and as I was mentioning, um, it's been interesting for me coming out of a much more narrowly defined philosophy department to encounter some of the uh, diversity of ethics at OISE and in the larger academic community. So I, I regret that this is really old news for some people in this room, um, but I think it's productive to take a, a bird's eye view at the philosophical study of ethics. This is the picture that I refer to. Of course, it's contested, and uh, I won't get into some of those debates, but it's worth flagging that this is not a kind of monolithic representation of ethics. So over here on the left, um, we have what I'm calling, for lack of a better term, value theory, which is the study of anything and everything relating to value. In other words, anything that cannot be resolved by empirical or quantifiable or scientific investigation. Questions of anything that is good or better, anything comparative or absolute in the realm of value. And what is good is the most basic ethical question, I would say, that applies not just to what is good for humans, but what is good for anything. And in the history of ethics, we find extensive discussion of what is good for animals and what is good for objects and what is good in various contexts. So what is good, just questions pertaining to value itself, are at the heart of this branch of ethics, and I would call it the broadest branch of ethics. And underneath that, we have um, what is just and what is beautiful, which are further applications of the th value theory, uh, which are called political philosophy and aesthetics, respectively. Again, this is a, a very cursory gloss, but I, I would say a fair summary of uh, how those areas fit into ethics while still retaining independence as disciplines. And then next over here, we have what is usually called normative ethics and what is, I would think, what most people think of when they think of ethics in an academic context. Um, and that is often simply called moral philosophy. Uh, this is concerned with a more specific question of value, namely how ought we to live or what is morally right. In other words, when people talk of ethics synonymously with moral conduct or right action, they're thinking of this branch of ethics, which is admittedly very large and influential, but not the only one, as I'm aiming to show. And we're also, um, many of us, familiar with some of the main schools of thought in ethics that, are, um, that characterize normative ethics. For instance, there's virtue ethics, which is most famously espoused by Aristotle. There's deontology, 
which is most famously espoused by Kant, and utilitarianism, which is associated with Mill, among others. And there are other, plenty of other normative theories as well, but these have been the most influential in the Western canon. And hence, a lot of what we talk about in normative ethics, in, in the study of what is right and how we ought to live, is framed by these main branches of thought. There's also a branch called, oops, meta-ethics over here, which asks questions about ethics itself, about the study of ethics itself. There are many questions in meta-ethics, which I can't enumerate here, but to give you a sense, questions such as, are there even ethical facts, which are, if you will, logically prior to normative ethical questions about what are those facts, how ought we to live, those fall under meta-ethics. And then there are associated psychological, epistemological um, aspects of meta-ethics, such as if there are ethical facts, how do we access them? Why should we assume that reason or revelation or experience or anything else is the golden path to ethical knowledge? And then what is going on when we make ethical judgments? So from a more cognitive perspective, what are we doing with our beliefs and, and values when we make ethical judgments? And then there's a huge and growing area of ethics called applied ethics, growing in part because as the world changes, uh, new ethical situations present themselves all the time. A good example of this is medicine and technology, how in the last few decades alone, there's been such an explosion in, in medical and technological developments that ethicists have been rightly uh, called in or just shown up uninvited to comment on the ethical implications of new realities. So some of the most um, well-known areas of applied ethics are business ethics and bioethics, and of course, the ethics of education, which is maybe a little less known or has fewer courses boasting its name, is still what I would count as an aspect of applied ethics. So that's where I would argue most of the discussion in ethics and education occurs. But part of my reason in showing you this map, other than to welcome you into my mind to help you see what I'm seeing, is to argue that ethics, sorry, that education permeates this entire picture of ethics and that ethics actually permeates education. And the rest of this talk will be a sketch of some of the different ways that I see ethics um, infusing education. So first, let me give you a sense of some of the most frequently discussed um, trenchant and challenging problems in the ethics of education, which fall under, in my view, this banner of applied ethics. You've, I'm sure, encountered a lot of these questions, if not in your own work, then just in moving in uh, educational circles, such as how much control should parents have over what their children learn in school, parental conscience, and so forth. How much bias is permissible in teaching before it turns into indoctrination? I phrase it that way. Of course, these are, these are all quite provocative questions. I phrase it that way because I take it that some bias is inevitable, and the question is how much and what type of bias is permissible. Um, how should religious topics be presented in public schools? Very hot debate in, in our locale these days. How should educational resources be distributed? Who deserves access to higher education? What is academic integrity? Why is it important? And when, if ever, are teachers justified in resisting professional expectations about what and how they will teach? So this is uh, by no means exhaustive. This is a very small sample of what I take to be some of the hottest issues in applied ethics in education. Now, there's a very closely related question which I would categorize as a meta-ethical question that goes along with some of these discussions, which is, is education ethically sui generis, where sui generis means a kind of its own, something that cannot be collapsed into or fully explained by other paradigms and frameworks. So another way of phrasing this is, can questions of applied ethics be solved using existing ethical frameworks, such as the deontology, the virtue ethics, the utilitarianism, and so on? Or do we actually need to invent um, or adjust our ethical frameworks and methods to account for what it is that makes education different from other fields to which ethics is applied, whether business or medicine or what have you? In other words, can we take those kinds of things which live in the normative ethics box and apply them constructively 
to ethics of education? And can we get the right answers? And can we get sufficient explanations by doing this? I'm not going to take a position on this right now. I'm just going to flag that this is a meta-ethical question that some philosophers of education do grapple with, uh, much aside from their substantive views about the questions on the preceding slide. Now, if you recall the far left box in my ethics map, which was value theory, um, there's a much more general and pervasive way in which education is affected by ethics and is indeed, I would say, a manifestation of ethics. And that is the fact that education is in and of itself normative. By normative, I mean following the classical philosophical account of normativity, that it presupposes and commends values, that it takes evaluative stances on things. And here I'm following a uh, a giant, R.S. Peters, who wrote a text called Ethics in Education in the 60s, where I think he makes this point very crisply. He says, education implies that something worthwhile is being or has been intentionally transmitted in a morally acceptable manner. It would be a logical contradiction to say that a man, 60s, had been educated, but that he had in no way changed for the better. So within the very definition of education itself, there is a normative force, there is a commendation of something, there is a value judgment. And that's before we've even decided anything about what education consists in or who should deliver it or how it should be delivered. Um, to use the phrase of another prominent analytic philosopher, Stevenson, um, education is a dynamic word. You can't say it without simultaneously conveying an opinion about something. Um, so education is always engaging with values, even if we don't yet know what those values are. Even if we haven't yet faced an ethical dilemma, such as how should educational resources be distributed. As soon as we're in any kind of educational situation, and I'm deliberately avoiding characterizing that because I don't want to limit our discussion to any particular educational situation, we're already transmitting values consciously or unconsciously, explicitly or unexplicitly. So you'll notice that this crisp definition I referred to leaves a lot of questions unanswered. It doesn't say what is worthwhile, and it doesn't say what is morally acceptable. It's a conceptual analysis of the term education, which locates those terms within the definition of education without yet saying what those terms mean on their own. Um, so it explains to us how education is always making what are usually implicit presuppositions about ethics in the form of that value theory, which I put on the far left of my ethics map, before we've dealt with any normative questions or questions about meta-ethics or applied ethics. Um, but notice that this is not yet the same as saying that all education is ethics or that all teachers are ethicists or anything of the kind. It actually leaves that a very wide open question, which I'll attempt to come back to at the very end of this talk. Practicing education, whatever that means, being a teacher, being a student, being an educational policymaker, what have you, is not the same as studying values or taking reflective positions on questions of value. It simply means that in all one's actions, one is already forwarding some values. And, and I would think that this normally happens fairly unconsciously. So what we have um, is what I'm going to call contentless normativity. This is one of the ways in which all education is ethical, is related to ethics, but in a very unspecific way. So there's R.S. Peters over here on the right with his famous pipe. Um, and he points this out because his purpose is not to put meat on the bones, so to speak, of ethics and education, but to show how normativity is built into education. So he says such a connection between education and what is valuable does not imply any particular commitment to content. It is a further question what the particular standards are in virtue of which activities are thought to be of value and what grounds there might be for claiming that these are the correct ones. All that is implied is a commitment to what is thought valuable. So I'd like to suggest that this is a useful but very bare bones explanation of the intersection between ethics and education and that 
as a, an analytic starting point, it's very useful because it shows us that even aside from particular ethical dilemmas, we're already in an ethical position in education. But it doesn't tell us much beyond that. So I'm going to go back to Emile to try to bring out some of the features of education that I think we feel intuitively and are part of our experience but aren't quite captured by this provisional explanation. One thing that a lot of teachers and educational researchers comment on and that I think is very valid but very hard to substantiate is that in a sense education is always about life. It's never just about the curriculum or the subject matter or a particular teacher-student's encounter. It's because we know on some level that education is about forming people who will live their own lives. And even if we're not the be-all and end-all in their formative experience, we are, as educators, contributing to the formation of themselves as people who will then go and live full lives. And as students, we're also appropriating experience and information, again, consciously or unconsciously, that's going to affect how we live our lives. But this is really stark in Emile, and this is one of the reasons I think that Emile can be read as a caricature of education that brings those common but somewhat intangible thoughts into very broad relief. Jean-Jacques says, prior to the calling of his parents is nature's call to human life. Living is the job I want to teach Emile. And he means that very literally because he's removed Emile from all the other predictable influences that will help him form his life and shape who he is as an adult. And he's brought him to this reclusive place in the country from birth to raise him. And of course, our immediate reaction is horror because this is ironically so unethical in itself, not to mention unfeasible and not to mention... Um, totally a figment of Rousseau's imagination. However, what it shows us is that in all education, we are, in a sense, learning about life um, in much more than just the, the standard way provided by the curriculum or provided by the educational opportunity. We are learning about how to interact with the world, about how to interact with others, and about how to form our own values and opinions. Of course, a prominent critique of Rousseau is that Jean-Jacques' values and opinions seem to be unreflectively transmitted to Emile, therefore not raising him into the autonomous adult he's supposed to be. But that is not proof that this is not part of education. If anything, it's a warning that if we're not careful, we wield too much power as educators and we can inadvertently raise people who are not autonomous or who have only imbibed the values and opinions that we've given them. But it doesn't change the fact that in all education there is a, a tutelage pertaining to all of life and consequently all matters of value. So ethics is at the heart of all the educational encounters, whether in the woods in France or in a school on Bloor Street. Um, it's teaching someone how to live their life, which is part of ethics in the sense of what is the good life. Um, and whoop, lost my page. And that's what I think um, Rousseau can teach us. Okay, now I'm going to turn to some other ethical thought that I think can help frame this a little more articulately and tell us what's going on perhaps in a meal that resonates with us even while provoking some of our strongest disapproval. Um, up till now, the ethics that I've been talking about, largely influenced by analytic ethics and by many of the presumptions of the rationalist tradition, sees ethics as um, uh, something that you have to figure out when the moment arises, something that can be explained in terms of right and wrong, in terms of principles and rules. I'm going to suggest that in order to move toward understanding education as ethics, in the broader sense that Emil suggests, as all of life, we need to revamp our understanding of ethics. And to do that, we have uh, some very influential philosophers to turn to. So first, I, I would like to suggest that we think of ethics as an encounter, as a human encounter, 
rather than as a dilemma or a series of choices. So certainly when we look at applied ethics, education as applied ethics, what we see is some kind of dilemma, distributive justice question, or conflicting rights, rights of the parents versus rights of the teacher. These fit into very recognizable analytic paradigms of ethical dilemmas. And I, and I think that that's all very important and requires very rigorous and reflective um, responses. But it doesn't seem to capture that situation of Jean-Jacques and Emile just sitting in the woods and figuring out life, or, or as it were, Jean-Jacques uh, creating Emile's life for him. Um, but if we think of ethics as an encounter, as something that is at the core of human relationships, but especially relationships where the formation of self is in question for one or both parties, it becomes much clearer why ethics is infused in education and not just isolated in those moments of policy quandaries. Um, and I talked about how the normativity of ethics implies the implementation of values. So every choice we make in education from what to teach to what to wear to where to stand in the classroom to whom to call on first includes some values which I've suggested are usually unconscious. That is true. But moreover, we can think of ethics not just as the conscious implementation of values, but any relationship of responsibility. Um, and, and I'll elaborate on this in a moment when I get to some of the continental philosophers. But it's a relationship that will emerge in any, in any human encounter, but particularly those where there is vulnerability and there is power, which is certainly something that characterizes the educational encounter. Um, we also need to think beyond this historical view that ethics presupposes idealized rational autonomy. What that means is that the person in the ethical situation is deliberating using reasons, using rules, using logic, and that ethical answers are derived through these very processes. If we think of ethics much more broadly as not being reducible to reason, not requiring some idealized version of autonomy, which after all, who can ever achieve, but rather as being about whole people, um, we're in a better position to see more of the ways that ethics infuses education. And finally, if we question the tacit assumption in much of ethical theory or historical ethical theory, that there's an ethical subject, sometimes called a moral agent, moral self, different, different subjects, different uh, terms apply, who precedes the ethical encounter, who has everything figured out, in other words, who has their values, who has their preferences, who has their reasons, and walks into an ethical encounter and then deliberates or negotiates or comes up with an answer. Um, that's a very limiting view of how ethical reasoning works. And, and again, I don't want to say that it's wrong or that it doesn't very helpfully explain some situations. But in education, it seems inadequate on several fronts. First of all, children and students, but primarily students who are children, can't possibly have the moral agency that is presumed to be present prior to ethical encounters by much of ethical theory. In fact, most of the normative theory, whether it's virtue ethics or deontology or whatever, um, all, is only talking about so-called rational adults, um, a problematic category in and of itself, but even more problematic when you think about how children and people who, aren't, who are otherwise not considered fully rational adults fit into that category. So in education, we shouldn't be thinking of the ethical subject prior to the educational situation. We should be thinking of the ethical subject emerging through an educational situation. And this is reflected in some more recent approaches to ethics where the ethical subject emerges through human encounters. And that's whether it's an adult or a child. But in education, we can see why the fact that there might be a child in the ethical encounter makes it all the more important to think beyond the rational adults paradigm. Um, so some of those criteria, if you will, that I've just mentioned for rethinking ethics in order to accommodate a broader, richer understanding of ed education as ethics have, of course, um, been purloined from very famous continental philosophers whom I will now credit. Um, there are many who fall into this tradition, but I just want to draw your attention quickly to three who I think are particularly influential in uh, expanding our thinking about ethics and education.
Um, the first is Buber, Martin Buber, um, who's a, a theologian and philosopher. Actually, all three of these philosophers were 20th century Jewish philosophers, which I don't think is really accidental because otherness and exteriority feature so prominently in their thinking, and uh, that may well be a reflection of their personal experiences. Um, that's Levinas, and that's Derrida. Um, so I'm just going to mention a few features of their thinking, which even though they weren't necessarily oriented to education, seem to lend themselves so naturally to education when we think about ethics in this more expansive way. Um, Buber in particular was famous for conceiving of ethics in terms of dialogical relationships, where um, both parties are in a kind of vulnerable position and are um, calling attention to humanity through their interaction with the other. So when we approach another in any situation, uh, Buber says, we encounter them as a thou, we don't encounter them as an it. We encounter them as a fundamental um, aspect of humanity that in turn requires our ethical response. It's prior to there being some kind of dilemma or prior to seeing a person in the street who is hurt, who needs your help. It's any encounter where humanity calls forth our attention and requires uh, that we take responsibility. Levinas over here expanded on these ideas um, tremendously, and I couldn't possibly summarize everything that Levinas says about, about uh, ethics in this talk, nor about its application to education. But one of the key ideas in Levinas's ethics is that responsibility um, summons us. It is not something that is earned or, ch or taken on by choice. As soon as we encounter the face of another, and the face here can be read literally as a face or much more metaphorically as, again, something about humanity, um, we are responsible in a, in a profound, inescapable, asymmetrical way, which is to say, much aside from whatever responsibility the other may have to us. The self is always responsible to another. And um, part of this is also the previously mentioned idea that the ethical self emerges through such encounters. Uh, it's not as though we have a fully, fully fashioned self and then ethics happens afterward. Ethics is that very process of becoming a self in relation to others. The self is no longer an atomistic, rational agent. And Derrida, building also greatly on, on his predecessors, these are in chronological order, um, doesn't present any kind of framework or code of ethics as such, but talks about um, ethics in the same kinds of terms that are common to some of these postmodern thinkers, such as alterity and exteriority, um, which again criticizes the tradition of thinking that we can have a whole concept of something um, and then make judgments about it as though there were no outside of that concept. This is something that Levinas critiques and calls it totalization. Um, for Levinas, alterity, which is, which is to say irreducible otherness, otherness that we can say nothing further about because all we know about it is that it is other. Um, that is the root of ethics and interestingly he also says that is the root of education. If we are teaching someone by definition, we are teaching them what is other. We are not teaching them something that they've already assimilated or totalized and rendered the same. We are teaching them something which can never be the same. And that is not just the subject matter again, but that is the very relationship itself. So ethics begins with an understanding and appreciation of otherness, of our own limitations, because we can't encompass everything in our concepts and render everything similar to what we already know. And it begins with the responsibility to that otherness that isn't contingent on any social arrangement or religious injunction, but just is as part of our humanity. So these very influential figures, about whom much more could be said, and I warned you that this was not going to be a detailed talk, um, in my view, corroborate the more um, open-ended understanding of ethics, which enables us to see education as intersecting with ethics on multiple levels. And it also helps us, I would say, to make sense of some of those intangible and pervasive experiences in education, such as what we see caricatured in a meal,
that resist um, explanation by more simplistic categories. There's another very important tradition in recent ethics, which although different from continental ethics, and I certainly wouldn't want to collapse them into one another, makes some of the same points um, and gives us much more material for thinking about ethics in education. And that's the feminist ethics of care. Um, interestingly, feminist ethics, which is a, a much contested term as you can imagine, um, traces its origins largely to Nell Noddings, who was also, uh, I think is, I think she's still alive, is a prominent philosopher of education. She's getting up there, but she's still alive. Um, and amazingly, um, she wasn't just trying to present a view of ethics and then present a philosophy of education and then connect them, which is the most that can be said for most of the figures I've discussed so far. Interesting volumes are now coming out about, for instance, Levinas in education. Levinas didn't write explicitly about philosophy of education, but people are seeing the obvious synergy between his ethics and education. But for Noddings, um, it wouldn't make any sense to separate ethics and education or a philosophy, a, a moral philosophy and an educational philosophy because the content of her ethics, the ethics of care, is already a manifestation of what happens in education. So let me try to explain this quickly. Um, Noddings argues that in contrast to the numerous reasons and theories offered by the major historical figures in, in Western ethics, all of our ethical obligations, all of our ethical um, duties and sentiments and values can be explained in terms of care. Care meaning literally caring for another person. Um, obviously a lot more would need to be said about what counts as care and what doesn't count as care, but her intuition is that our most vulnerable beginning in life as, as helpless infants who depend on the care of a parent or someone else sets us up for understanding care as the source of all ethical relationships. So we can see in parenting, but particularly motherhood, and I won't, I won't address the feminine part of her feminist ethics of care unless somebody wants to ask about it later, um, but particularly parenthood is a kind of paradigm for all ethical relations because the care of the infant, which is so obvious and so fundamental to that relationship, is also present in a less visible and less urgent form in all other human relationships. And interestingly, education is not far removed from parenting along that scale of other relationships because what is happening in education, if not the care, the care of the person, the care of the intellect, the care of the character of another person or other people. So she thinks that um, parenting and education actually provide a kind of manifestation of what ethics is. It's not ethics applied to education, it's more education along with parenting showing us what ethics is. Um, so there's Nell Noddings. And she has no trouble making this leap to educational policy through her ethics of care. She says the primary aim of every educational institution and of every educational effort must be the maintenance and enhancement of caring. Um, I, I won't say that this is uh, the same as the continental perspective, but it shares with, not to mention the fact that there's not just one continental perspective, but. Um, based on what I've said um, in this cursory presentation, what the feminist ethic of care as articulated by Noddings shares with the continental perspective is first of all a focus on human relationships and who a person is rather than what a person does or what is decided. Ethics is removed from the rarefied realm of reasoning and placed squarely in the real experience of relationships. Otherness, the fact that we cannot simply comprehend and assimilate the other, but must approach the other with humility, with curiosity, and with care, is common to both of these ways of thinking. And again, I would suggest that this helps us explain something very fundamental about education, which doesn't come through in some of the other ways of thinking about ethics. Um, most especially education of young children, but certainly not exclusively. In the education of young children, we see that 
the care for the whole person, the care to develop this child into the kind of person that she wants to be, that we want her to be, that she can choose to be later on, is central to the whole project. We can't separate the, the math lesson, uh, especially at this age, from the care of the whole person. And again, I think this helps us explain some of the more jarring features of a meal. So to fast forward a bit, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the story, Jean-Jacques raises Emile in isolation um, from society. And then when the time is right, he decides that he's going to find Emile a partner. And the, the manner in which this is done is incredibly orchestrated and artificial and certainly subject to criticism. But what ends up happening is Emile falls in love with the woman whom Jean-Jacques has conveniently chosen for him, named Sophie. Uh, and not surprisingly named Sophie, because he's already told Jean-Jacques that he will fall in love with the woman of tremendous virtue. Um, and at the very end of the book, they're married, and um, ostensibly Jean-Jacques is no longer a student and no longer a child. He is now an adult in all of the, quote, natural and societal ways. And um, in the very last paragraph of the book, he announces that he's going to be a father. So um, our intuition would tell us, OK, bye, Jean-Jacques. It's time for you to move on. And uh, thank you for spending the last 20 years with uh, Emile here. But interestingly, Emile says, this, these, these are the words of Emile. Emile says to Jean-Jacques, remain the master of young masters. Advise us and govern us. We shall be docile. As long as I live, I shall need you. I need you more than ever now that my functions as a man begin. So on the one hand, horror, <laughs> not to mention how can this be ethical? How can this teach us anything about ethics? Um, but again, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that this is a caricature of a lot of what happens in education and that is explained by continental and feminist, but in this case, particularly feminist perspectives. Namely that although we hope our children aren't kidnapped and raised in a secluded patch of the woods by a strange man, um, whoever is educating children is teaching them about relationships and dependency as well as about whatever else they're teaching. And what jars us, I think, about the situation in Emil is that all of this responsibility and all of this power is located in the single person of Jean-Jacques. And that strikes us as very detrimental to Emile's education and to his understanding of other relationships. And it's not much of a surprise that he needs ongoing guidance when he needs Sophie, because he's hardly had a conversation with a woman, let alone been in a marriage, because he's been entirely dependent, not just cognitively, but emotionally and physically on Jean-Jacques. But if we think of education as um, teaching about relationships by modeling relationships and as preparing one for more, uh, more adult relationships in a sequential manner by treating the student in a way that's appropriate to their age and gradually exposing them to other types of relationships and other types of people. Um, I think this is actually very accurate. We just wouldn't want it to happen with one person. If we think of the power that Jean-Jacques here, has here as distributed among all the different people, teachers, principals, guidance counselors, not to mention parents and aunts and uncles and friends who educate young people. Um, I think this makes quite a lot of sense, but it doesn't make sense in a strictly applied ethics way or even a normative ethics way. It makes sense in a relational ethics way. And that's what Nell Nodding's great insight was, I think, that education is um, a kind of heightened example of the caring relationship that we seek to achieve in all our relationships. And it shouldn't be surprising that our educators, all in sundry, would affect the way that we pursue further intimate relationships, such as Emile's relationship with Sophie. It's a little creepy, perhaps, to think of Jean-Jacques continuing to instruct them as a married couple. But I don't think it's far-fetched to say that our educators do affect, consciously or unconsciously, how we relate to others. And they have set us up for different ethical ways of being by their relationships with us. I know that some people have to leave. Don't feel badly. Just step out as you need to. I'm going to wrap up soon. <laughs>
Um, so what are some of the implications of these perspectives that I've been dwelling on for the last part of the talk, and what can they add to existing perspectives? I found this phrase recently that I really like. I've been using the phrase education as ethics to get away from ethics of education. Um, but I found this phrase which I think functions quite similarly, and it's implied as opposed to applied ethics. And it's attributed to a Levinasian scholar named Sharon Todd. So I'm just going to show you this quotation. And I think it captures a lot of the continental perspective, although she's talking about Levinas in particular. An implied ethics takes seriously the conditions of the self's implications in responding to the other within an educational setting. And it means reading education through a structure of alterity, where the emergence of the ethical subject is at stake in teaching learning encounters. So this helps us to um, articulate what's going on beyond the transmission of particular values or the negotiation of particular moral dilemmas. However, it has some downsides. For instance, no clear rules emerge. And indeed, some of the continental ethical frameworks that I've surveyed here have been accused of not being ethics at all because they don't provide any guidance about what is good or isn't good. They effectively say that we are in an ethical situation and one has responsibility, which can be quite a burden, especially if you don't know what to do with it. So, um, whereas the normative theories that have characterized most of the tradition, such as deontology, gives us rules and principles, the, the, the sort of post-analytic ethical frameworks um, point out the limitations of rules and principles, but not really supplying anything comparable that can help us figure out questions of value or what is good. It's almost as though everything becomes ethics and we don't know how to be ethical. Moreover, as applied to education, this isn't going to provide any particular ethical, uh, pedagogical guidance. So it's lovely to think of educational relationships as relationships of care, and I think that can be a very validating perspective for teachers to take on, but it doesn't tell you what to do necessarily if someone is misbehaving in class or if there's an, a disagreement or anything else. It also would seem to burden educators by saying that not only are you transmitting values unconsciously, and not only are you involved in an enterprise which is normative by definition, but also just by being an educator, you are always in an ethical situation. No pressure. I think viewing it this way does run the risk of uh, making educators too responsible in ways that they um, can't conceive. But it does help us capture something critical namely that experience of education being about life and the formation of self and learning about relationships as opposed to just learning curriculum and subject matter. So I'm certainly not throwing out any perspective or suggesting that one is better than the other, but I think a more inclusive view of ethics can go farther in explaining a lot of education. So I don't, I, I don't know if you could read the bottom here, so I just reprinted it in the bubble. Um, a few questions arising, no doubt, will be about more practical matters of the intersection between ethics and education. And um, these, for the most part, revert to applied ethics, but I think we need to perhaps consider them in a new light if we're going to view education as ethics instead of just applied ethics. So, for instance, uh, questions about where ethics belong in the curriculum are not answered by taking any particular approach to what ethics is. However, we can see that ethics is going to be, quote, in the curriculum anyway. It, so it becomes a question of how explicit should ethics be in the curriculum, who decides what goes in the curriculum, how is it integrated with other subjects. In other words, it reverts to applied ethics. But one thing we know now is that ethics already is always in the curriculum. Um, at least in the sense of values being transmitted and ethical relationships being formed. Doesn't tell us uh, how to teach math, though. Um, another hot topic in uh, ethics and education in the realm of applied ethics and policy decisions is what is the place for moral education and or what is sometimes called character education, um, I think the currently favored term in, in our jurisdiction anyway is character education, um, how does that fit in? So not just how do you teach the study of ethics, which is a separate question, but 
how, if at all, do you stipulate what kinds of moral attributes are desirable in students and then nurture them? Well, as it turns out, the Toronto District School Board has identified 10 distinct official character virtues that it seeks to uh, engage and cultivate in all its activities. I think this is quite fascinating, and I just found out about these, how official these were recently. Um, I'll just make a couple of quick comments. I'm not going to take a position on this or anything, but first of all, you might notice that this smacks a little bit of virtue ethics. Um, in other words, the normative position according to which moral uh, decision-making, moral philosophy is answered through um, identifying a list of virtues that are proper to all human beings. I'm not sure that all of these are virtues, at least in the Aristotelian sense. Some of them are perhaps more matters of expediency or classroom management and not necessarily ethical virtues. But it does, it, it, it is an interesting um, regression to Aristotle after all that's come in between to think of what we should be cultivating in students as some kind of list of attributes. Um, also, I just want to ask, how do teachers understand and implement these official attributes? And I started to have a great conversation with a, a primary school teacher about this recently. They are told that it's their job in the TDSB to make sure that these character traits are present in their classroom and so forth, but they're not told how. So in addition to the question of who decides what these are, um, there's the question of what does it actually mean for teachers and how does it get translated into an educational setting? And I'm just going to leave that open, but I, I think it's interesting that somebody somewhere in the TDSB has taken a very strong stance on where moral education belongs in the curriculum or character education, um, but it's still quite open to interpretation. I also want to say a word quickly, this is certainly a talk in itself, but I'll save it for another time, about education and social justice. So, I'm going to pose this as a bit of a paradox. On the one hand, from everything I've said, it's perfectly understandable why education would be viewed not only as compatible with social justice or as ripe for social justice, but as social justice, as a positive transformation of the world via the ethical transformation of students. This is perfectly consonant with everything I've said. So we can make sense of teachers, for instance, feeling a strong pull to social justice because they see their roles as educators as perhaps giving them a privileged position to make positive transformation in the world above and beyond the obligation or opportunity that another professional, say a banker or a construction worker may have. So even if we think it's everybody's obligation to contribute to social justice, it really stands to reason that educators are in a sort of extra right position to do this. At the same time, um, the preceding analysis of education as ethics doesn't tell us what social justice is. And social justice, like education itself, is a dynamic word, a word that everyone wants to sign on to. I don't think you'll find any politician, for instance, um, explicitly distancing themselves from social justice, but you will certainly find great differences between a politician's conception of social justice and, you know, conceptions that inform some of the research in this department, for instance. And that results in a lot of suspicion that what educators are choosing to do is not social justice in a kind of um, broad ethical sense, but more of a political intervention. And you get covers like this McLean's magazine cover from a few months ago where it's asked why educators are, quote, hijacking the classroom to push their own political agenda under the moniker of social justice. Um, so again, I'm not going to resolve this issue for you now. I just want to point out that there's a natural resonance between education and social justice. But just as Peters mentioned about the values implicit in education, we don't yet know what the values implicit in social justice are and whether they belong conceptually to education or whether they're a kind of further application of education to different ends. And the final question I, I want to put on the table is, does what I have said imply that all educators are or ought to be ethicists? If indeed education is in some sense um, not synonymous with but 
overlapping with education. I certainly wouldn't reduce all of ethics to education or all of education to ethics. But if there's this inescapable overlap, what does that say about the role of educators? And should we be very worried if educators don't all have advanced degrees in ethics? Um, I think it, again, depends very much on what definition of ethics we're using and what branches of ethics we're talking about. So in a sense, all educators do have to be ethicists because many of the questions in applied ethics about education, what is the role of the teacher, how much freedom of expression is the teacher entitled to, what counts as indoctrination, and so on, a lot of these matters are codified as professional ethics. And like in many professions, teachers, in Ontario anyway, have to sign on to a certain set of professional ethics. And I believe in faculties of education, they're also encouraged and taught to think somewhat critically about how to interpret those uh, codes. There's a lot of research on this um, about the ethics of teaching. And when I see all of these volumes, I think they're serving a very important purpose, but not talking about what I'm thinking of when I talk about ethics in education. And Liz Campbell had to leave, but of course our very own Liz Campbell from OISE is the author of one of these volumes on um, the ethical teacher, where she does an excellent job, I think, of explaining that the teacher is, a, is in a situation of applied ethics. There's a lot of informal applied ethics for teachers, too, where their teachers often trade with each other uh, things to do and not do if they want to be respected and not get in trouble. This is one of my favorites. Um, teachers are rightly suspicious of Facebook because personal lives are something to which teachers are not equally entitled, as it turns out. So a lot of teachers may avoid having Facebook accounts. Um, but that doesn't tell us what it means to be an ethicist. So I'm saying that teachers have ethical obligations. They are correctly instructed about their ethical obligations, and they are hopefully reflective about their ethical obligations. But there's a difference between being ethical and being an ethicist. So I guess to conclude, um, it would be fair to say, we hope that educators are ethical, but we don't expect all educators to be ethicists. And I hope that provides a clear and somewhat um, engrossing account of the field of ethics and how I see it overlapping with education. Thank you. Should I, should I come sit here? Yeah. Um, Lauren, yes. Yes. No, it's easier than doing that. I want to make a reference to it. That's all. It's just easier to go back to the show. So while she's, she's doing this, um, I want to thank Karen for um, starting, launching these, these sessions. Uh, I think um, for an institution like OISE, I think it is crucial to have these intellectual inquiries rather than simply be engaged most of the time in bureaucratic and academic stuff. So thank you. And thank you also for inviting me. I also want to thank um, Lauren for, for, for the talk. I know this is not easy. I mean, it's a broad subject. Um, it brought back to me the kind of work I used to do 30 years ago when I was writing my doctoral thesis on R.S. Peters mm -hmm. and the critique of R.S. Peters' work. So I have three main points to make, and each of these points I will uh, end with a question so that then we can have a bit of a dialogue and with the rest as well. I'm not seeing this in a traditional sense as, you know, in a formal PES critiquing, attacking, and so on. So this is an open inquiry. Okay, but two quick um, preliminary, very, very preliminary points. Uh, the, we use the words, uh, in philosophy, we use the words moral and ethics very interchangeably. And there is a good reason for that, and that is the etymology. Uh, the, word, the English word moral is derived from the Latin moris, which means a custom. And ethics is from the Greek ethos, which also means a custom, a way of being. So obviously, when we're talking about ethics and morals mixed, Right? We're obviously talking about life. And I think being human is, in a sense, makes us always in an ethical situation. And um, this relates to the latter point that, that you make. So, my first point now, my first point I want to do by uh, allow me to read one page from, from a novel. This is from Tahar Benjelon, a philosopher and a novelist, Moroccan, who lives in, in France. 
and I hope I will not offend anyone by reading this one page. Um, Mohammed, who was the major character in the novel, felt that lopping off a hand for stealing a slipper was too harsh, even cruel. He stared at his open hands for a long time and thought, without them, I would have been nothing, not even a beggar. May Allah protect us from evil and misfortune. A beggar held out his thumb to him. Muhammad slipped some money into his pocket. He would have liked to talk with him to learn his story. Perhaps he'd lost his hand in an accident or been the victim of some mistake, but the beggar had vanished. Whenever Muhammad told people back home about his pilgrimage, Muhammad now lives in France, he got into trouble. Bahir, who had an opinion about everything, gave him a lecture between sips of nice, cool beer. A Muslim must not criticize what happens during the Hajj. Leave that to the enemies of Islam, those who want to see us perpetually underdeveloped in rags, dirty and inhuman. Now, they have managed to label all Muslims terrorists. It's simple. We're doomed to stagnate or to slide backwards. So criticism, forget about it, even if what you say is true, or else we'll stop calling you Haji. Muhammad had the last word in his soft voice. If we don't criticize ourselves, we'll never get anywhere. Well, I'll keep quiet and wish you bon voyage, a good pilgrimage. But me, if I go back, it won't be during the main Hajj. I'll choose the little one, the Umrah. Besides, you know, we need to learn tolerance. For example, you drink, but I never mention it. That's your business, and I'm not going to scold you. So stop criticizing those who have the courage to criticize themselves. Okay, and we can unpack this. Okay, so I want to use this to raise three questions. Um, my first one is, um, uh, in this sense, I think, and I think you made this point, applied ethics can be very dangerous because it gives us the illusion that there is something which we have constructed, which is called ethics, and then you apply it, and, and this is applied ethics. While, while, if I understand ethics well, and I use this as an example from daily living, right? Uh, the ethics is the actual doing. And I think your use of the word implied rather than applied may hint to this. And hence my first question. What is the point of doing meta-ethics? And I had done it for 13, 14 years, okay? Um, that's, that's my first point. The second point is to remind ourselves um, that um, both Aristotle and Plato, um, to start from there, I think there, are, there is more other philosophy as, as, as others have shown us that started earlier than Aristotle and Plato and, and, and Socrates uh, and the African continent. But as we, let's say, with Aristotle and Plato, okay, um, it, is, it is very telling to me that both Aristotle and Plato talk about education in their political treatises, right? I mean, the Republic, is that an educational treatise? Is it an ethical treatise? Is it a political treatise? Usually it is seen primarily as a political treatise. In that case, it is within politics that Plato wants us to consider education and ethics. And I think this is very telling. Aristotle, who disagreed with him, on this point agrees. Aristotle talks about education a bit in, in the ethics, but quite a bit in, in a more substantive way in the politics, and in this, interestingly, in the chapter on the family, which it, I take it he's telling us, even within families, there are political issues, okay? If this is the case, then why focus on ethics? Why not focus on politics? And this, this is why I wanted this. I mean, yes, surely, what is good, um, what is just, you, and you have political philosophy, but political philosophy is also about how do we associate together and live well together. In that sense, I want to ask, why not just do politics? 
and forget ethics. And by doing politics, we would be doing both education, we would be doing both ethics, and also, of course, not forgetting politics. I know I'm pushing. The third point is about, um, is about, I think, the challenge of liberalism. And I know you couldn't deal with everything in your, in your schemata. I think even in Tahar ben Jalun, who I think is in some way pushing us to consider a variety of things, there is a strong dosage of liberalism in his thinking and in his writing. And he considers himself to be a postmodernist of some kind. Um, but th th this is partly my problem with some of the postmodern work it had in ethics. Um, it still remains hooked with the individualism of liberalism. In a sense, also with the rationalism of liberalism, the neutrality of liberalism. Um, and, 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 uh, and I think this has had a lot of impact on, on how we look at ethics and education, the relationship between, between the two. There are some people like Audrey Tronsem and our own Dwight Boyd who I think have in their work tried to question these kinds of things uh, without being afraid of the ideological issues in ethics itself. But we feel compelled at times or we feel torn exactly because, and I include myself here, we are so much impacted by the hidden curriculum of liberalism focusing on individualism, neutrality, and rationality, that every time we try to do ethics in a different way, to live it in a different way, let's say through it through literature rather than to formal stuff, through incidents rather than through formal dilemmas where you to have rationally decide, we are almost made to feel guilty. So I would end with the question, isn't the biggest problem for ethics liberalism? Okay. <laughs> you, Karen asked me to ask some challenging things and so on for the dialogue. So, okay. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm not expecting you, you know, I mean, this is for all. I, I had it, and I hadn't seen these questions before. <laughs> um, these are very interesting questions. Um, no, no, they're, they're very important perspectives to bring to the discussion. I would say that all three questions, which, correct me if I, I got them wrong, are why do metaethics, um, why not talk about education in terms of politics instead of ethics, and isn't the real problem in ethics liberalism, um, I think are all versions of a, a larger question, if I'm understanding you correctly, um, and not surprisingly why you wanted my my conceptual map up here, my... It's very helpful and correct. Good, good. And I mean, it's clearly um, supposed to be a representation of, you know, classic Western modern ethics as it's been explained and taught, especially in universities for many years. It's not supposed to be what ethics really is uh, or, you know, what ethics could be. It's supposed to be the, the philosophical arena as it's usually parsed. Um, but I, the reason it makes sense to have it up there is because part of what you're asking is, for all these questions, um, what is the value of ethics? What is the ethics of ethics? What is the value of doing value theory? Um, and, and why cash it out this way? And why think that education should conform in some way to this model? And I think I've thankfully already answered part of the question because my talk is partly about why education doesn't conform to this model, the limits of this model. Um, but I was also trying to show that every branch of this admittedly reductive model does tell us something about education. So there are sort of myriad paths for thinking about education and ethics. But as to the question of the, the value of ethics in, in this way, um, I, I, I would need longer to form a, I mean, I do have opinions about it, but I, I would need longer to formulate really convincing responses. I'll, I'll try to say a couple of things. Um, I think the value of a lot of things in academia, and especially philosophy, which is the area of academia that I just happen to be most familiar with, is um, not so much that it is somehow correct or that it is instrumentally useful for other things that we value, but that the exercise of thought and 
critical engagement with others that it engenders is valuable itself. Now, that's a claim within value theory, which according to this map, I would have to justify by some further criterion, and it's an infinite regress. But I do think that as a starting point, uh, something that we all sign on to in part as academics, educators, and, and people involved in inquiry, and, and I, and I want to separate inquiry from um, academic work passing, dogma passing itself off as academic work, right, or policy passing itself off as academic work. In inquiry, we value the process of inquiry itself. And there are many different ways of going about inquiry. But I think that even in this liberal infused, uh, very westernized map of ethics, there is so much um, grist for thought. And when I teach ethics, and I often, depending on the course, I'll often start with a map like this, or I'll, I'll take the subject matter and try to pinpoint it somewhere. Um, I'm trying to give the students, anyway, an entry point to see that they can stand on the shoulders of, of centuries of very intelligent people, granted dead white men for the most part, but still very intelligent people, who can give us ways of pushing our thinking. And we wouldn't have Levinasian ethics, and we wouldn't have feminist ethics, if it were, and we wouldn't have post-liberal ethics or anything if it weren't a response in somehow to this. So I think uh, while recognizing the limits of the canon and the assumptions that there are correct ways of doing ethics or of doing any academic inquiry, we're also validating that as a starting point. We're also saying that we're on a trajectory which exactly as the continental and ethical and, and feminist ethics would say, um, is relational, where we're not starting in a vacuum, we're not, you know, Descartes in his study, we're not a brain in a vat, we are in a historical continuum where ideas have accumulated and been critiqued and been modified through centuries. And I think that very exercise of thinking with the canon and thinking with the critiques is itself of value and is what gives us the opportunity to say that this is only one way of doing ethics. So I hope that goes some distance to answering perhaps all three questions, although a lot more would have to be said about each of them. Thank you, Lauren. And we can continue. You know, uh, gladly. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It was really a pleasure. <laughs>